life sciences to yet another wonderful life science lesson. We are on the journey of the microorganism. In this series of um, lessons, we're looking at the concepts of what microorganisms are and especially what they can cause. And we're looking specifically at diseases and ones that are, are found in South Africa particularly. If you had followed the last lesson, you would have looked at viruses, right? Very, very, very important um, microorganisms. Microorgan if you've, I'm sure you've heard of COVID, if you've lived through COVID, you understand what the concept of a virus is. Today, we're going to look at the microorganism that we call bacteria. Now, if you have a look on the board here, I've posed a question and I've said to them over here, that they can make us sick, right? But we cannot do without them at all, right? We need bacteria in our lives. Although we're gonna look at the ones that are going to be pathogenic, bad for us, right? Bacteria are essential, right? For us to actually live healthily. But unfortunately, there are some that we're gonna look at that are going to make us sick. Right, so let's take a look at what bacteria are. Oh, we got to just, there we go. So if we have a look at our concept map, what are we going to look in today's lesson? It's very similar to the concepts that we look at when we looked at viruses. So we want to look at a bacteria. What must you know? You must know what they look like. You must know their characteristics. How do we mean by that? Is how they operate. How do they function? Maybe knowing that, what can we do? Can we cure them? Can we kill them? Can we get rid of them? And in that vein, I'm going to go over four diseases with you that you just need to know one of them. You don't need to know all four of them. And when we look at diseases, I need to, you need to know what effect does that disease have on me and how am I going to manage the spread of the disease? Okay, so let's start looking at this concept of what bacteria are. I've got keywords on the board here. I'm not going to go through all of them individually. As you know, right, as we go through them, right, we're going to do, we're going to discuss those terms. Okay, so when we look at bacteria, maybe in previous models, you might have looked at the, the section called the classification and biodiversity. Now, classification is all living things on this planet are put into different kingdoms. And basically what it is, it's a checklist. So if you've got this, 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 you go into this kingdom. If you have this, this, this criteria, you go into that kingdom. And you might have done, all right, the kingdoms that you would have looked at was plants, animals, fungi, protists, Right, and what we're looking at today, Monera. The kingdom Monera is where bacteria fits in. And those specific characteristics mean that all bacteria have got certain things, characteristics that put them into that particular kingdom. Just have a look at a few that I'm hoping might ring a bell. Okay, so guys, if you belong to the kingdom Monera, and let me get my pen ready here, choose my beautiful blue. Right, we've said, there we go, the kingdom Monera. There's a few words that I just want you to, right, be able to remember. They are unicellular. Unicellular means one. You're going to see now when we look at the structure, bacteria are only one cell. They are also the only cells that are prokaryote. And I don't know if you remember it, what is a prokaryote cell? It's a single cell that has DNA in the middle and it has no nuclear bound structure. So it will have a ribosome, but it won't have anything else. There won't be any Golgi body, there won't be any nuclear membrane, there won't be any mitochondria. Okay. So that's where we're looking, prokaryotic. When we come to bacteria, we said most are useful, 
But remember this term pathogenic. What does pathogenic mean? They're going to produce disease. Now, the very last point is really important when it comes to this. We're not going to look at it during this lesson, but we might look at it, we're going to look at it in further lessons. Guys, bacteria can be killed by antibiotics. When we looked at the lesson um, in this model before this, when we looked at viruses, viruses couldn't be killed. Right, so we can use vaccines, et cetera, to try and build antibodies, but a bacteria is a living cell, and we have medicines, antibiotics, that can kill them. Okay, so let's have a look at what a bacteria cell looks like. A bacterium, singular, and we're going to have a look at a typical cell. Okay, so guys, let's have a look here. So when it comes to the structure, as I said, it's prokaryotic, and what it has, it's got three layers around it. Can you see here? It's a cell membrane or a plasma membrane. So this is the one layer. All living things have a cell membrane. Then it has a cell wall around it. It's not a plant cell. Yes, plant cells have a cell wall, but this is not a plant. It doesn't have characteristics of plants. And then you'll see a very special thing around the third layer is a capsule. And basically what that means is sometimes a bacteria cell can actually form like a spore. That capsule can form a hard cover and the bacteria can be dormant. Dormant means it's not doing anything and it can just lie there until conditions are ideal. And when conditions are ideal, that bacteria might emerge from its capsule. Okay, what else? Very important, in the middle, the cell, we have the DNA. Unlike a virus, which is DNA or RNA, it's the genetic material. All right, and that is important. Living things need to reproduce. Now, we've got, if you look inside here, we have got ribosomes. And ribosomes are organelles, but they do not have all right, a membrane. And that is why they are in right, the, um, the bacteria cells. And they are there because they are going to make protein. Very important. Now, when we have an antibiotic, the antibiotic stops these ribosomes from working. If it can't make a protein, you're going to see it's going to die. Now, this is a little tail on the end of a bacteria. Not all bacteria have tails. Okay, a tail, a tail is there if it needs to swim, and not all bacteria need to be able to swim. Okay, so guys, you really need to know the structure of a bacterium. You might be able to, well, you might have to draw it, but you definitely need to know the labels and the functions for each of the different parts. Okay, the same as you had to do for when you do the virus. Now, when we look at bacteria, you will see they are actually classified according to their shapes. And we usually find three, sometimes four, different shapes of bacteria. And we often give them the name of the cell, right, according to the shape of the different bacteria. Let's have a look at the words. Okay, so if over here, if they are rod-shaped, can you see these are like that? Then we call it a bacillus. And you're going to see a lot of the bacteria that we're going to look at today are bacillus cells. If they are round, they are called cochi. All right, and lots of you, right, have actually had this before. And it's a streptococcus. And you're all thinking, oh, my soul, what is that? It's very simply a sore throat, okay? You can get a sore throat, and that bacteria that attacks your throat and makes it sore is called a strep coccus. And I don't know if you might have strep cells if you have a sore throat. That will help you with that. And the very last one over here is a spirilli, a spiral. Okay, and this one over here, unfortunately, that is an STD. 
and that is syphilis. All right, syphilis is one of, is a spiral, and it's a sexually transmitted disease, and these are all bacteria. And as I said to you, all the bacteria that we are looking at, you can treat with, right, antibiotics. So that is going to be a good sign. Okay, now, bacteria are living, which means they can reproduce. Unlike a virus, when we looked at last time, they had to actually go to a host cell to be able to reproduce. Bacteria whew, reproduce on their own, and they do it very, very quickly. And that's why we can use a lot of biotechnology. We can use bacteria to actually make things that we need. And we'll look that, at that in later lessons when we look at how we can use bacteria to make human insulin. So bacteria don't need a host, right, like the virus did. Basically what they're going to do, it's a process called binary fission. So you need to know the term, okay, that's what it's called. We don't call it mitosis, and we don't call it cloning, although that is actually what it is. Okay, so very simply, if you'll have a look here, all that a bacteria cell is going to do, here's the cell, it's going to make a copy of its DNA so that it can put one copy in one side, one copy in the other. The cytoplasm is going to divide, and what do we have? Probably two identical bacterium cells. So nice and easy, right? And that is why you will notice if your bacteria, once it starts to grow, right, grows very, very, very quickly, especially if it's a nice, warm environment. That's why we put our food in the fridge, right, so that we can stop it or slow down the process of it dividing to make more coffee, copies of itself so our food doesn't go off. Okay, guys. That's it for now. We're going to take a quick little break and we'll see you right back just now. Welcome back, Life Sciences. I hope you had a good little break, maybe had a sip of water and a little snack. Remember, we are looking at bacteria. And if you have a look at the concept map behind me, we have so far ticked off characteristics and structure of bacteria. It's not a very intense, difficult right, section that we're doing. Can you, can you identify that it's a bacteria? How is it different to the other microorganisms that we look at? And do you understand the concept that bacteria are single cells and that we can treat them by using antibiotics? That is very important. What I'm going to run through now is I'm going to look through four different diseases. And as I said to you, you only need to look at one in detail. So you might choose one or your school might choose one for you, right? But you still need to have a broader um, knowledge of what the concepts of bacteria are. So we're going to go through the four bacteria diseases. As I said, and you just we're going to go through them briefly just the basic points of them. And for each one, we're going to look at two things. What do they do to us? And actually, we've got one here that, that actually attacks plants, right? We've got bacteria that can attack plants. Viruses could also attack plants. And we're going to look at how we manage it. It's very important. We have gone through the COVID. How do we stop the spread? How are we going to stop making people sick? What can we do? And very often, what can our government do for us? Okay, let's have a look at our first disease. Okay, guys, we are looking at the four that I've put up here in yellow. We're going to be looking at TB. We're going to be looking at anthrax. We're going to be looking at cholera. And we're going to be looking at blight. And I'm going to put here blight rust. All right, two things that we're going to look at. So what's our first disease? The first disease we're going to look at is a serious, serious disease in our country. And it's called tuberculosis, or TB. And very often, it's a disease that we link with HIV AIDS. Okay, because what happens is, if lots of times, 
if our immune system is compromised or down, it's very easy. Bacteria can come into our bodies, right, and they can then make us ill and they can even attack us. So the first one we're looking at is TB. So what is TB? Let's have a look at the diagram over here. As I said to you, it's caused by a bacillus. Can you see that? It's rod-shaped. It's a bacillus bacteria, and it's often found in cattle, in cows. And what it is, there are spores in there, the bacteria. And we breathe them in, and they then go and sit in our lungs. Okay. So we breathe in, maybe somebody sneezes, coughs, we touch something. It's very much the same as when we look at the flu and COVID. And it goes into our body and it goes and settles in our lungs. Now, probably a lot of you could have TB and you won't even know it. And the reason being is because you're healthy. So if I'm healthy, my immune system right, can fight the bacteria or what it does it can make a little capsule, like I've drawn here, around the bacteria, and it actually stops it from spreading. Okay, so basically what the TB does is going to attack our lungs. So it's going to have an effect on how we breathe. So when we look at all the, the different kinds of effects, so how does it affect us? Have a look at all these pictures over here. You will see... All right, I've put nice little pictures, much easier sometimes to remember a picture. But what it does is, is we're tired because our lungs, we're not, our lungs are damaged, so we're not getting enough oxygen in. So our body's tired, we, we, we've got a headache, we cough a lot, and sometimes when we cough, there could be blood in our cough. Not all the time, but yes. We might have fever, we might have sweat, and... If it carries on in our body, it can get to the stage where it's going to literally destroy our lungs and ultimately it could cause death. So it, it, it's a very serious um, disease if it is not treated. So as you have a look over there, right, you lose weight, um, you, you're not healthy, you're not healthy and, you're, and the bacteria is slowly starting to take over your lungs, which are your oxygen trees and you definitely need those. So what do we have to do? That is the main, right, that is the main question. Let's have a look over here. The treatment is called DOTS, right? And that means directly observed therapy short course. What does it mean? It simply means this. TB can be cured if you have the TB that's not drug resistant. If you are able to go to a doctor, you go and you must get yourself tested. It's the same as HIV, know your status. If you have TB, they're going to start you on a long-term course of antibiotics, usually six months. And what DOTS is, direct observation, all right, is very simply, they are going to give you your medicine every single day. And it's six months worth. And that is the problem because very often people feel better a little bit after taking the antibiotics, and then they stop. And then that bacteria that is still in your body doesn't die, and it starts developing again. And sometimes what could happen is the bacteria could mutate, which means change, and it can mutate into the bacteria that doesn't respond to any antibiotics. And that means that it's not going to be cured, right? Mult, multiple drug-resistant TB, and you don't want to get that. How else are we going to keep ourselves nice and healthy? All right, guys, we need to have a nice diet. We not tr try to need to eat properly. We need to exercise. We need to stop overcrowding. There's quite a few, right? If we look at the management, you will see there's quite a few things that we need to do but we also need to look at the South African situation, all right? Does everybody have access to healthy foods? No. Does everybody have a nice, spacious, big house? No, all right? So when we look at South Africa, right, when we look at our poverty and we look at when people are forced to live together in very small areas, unfortunately, it makes the spread of TB much easier. 
Okay, and often people don't want to know. They don't want people to know that they have TB because it has a stigma towards that. And unfortunately, right, we, we need to know so that you can be treated. Big problem, big killer, all right? A really big killer. It's probably the biggest killer, right, other than HIV and malaria in our country. Okay, I'd, some of you I don't think you might have ever heard of this one before. Okay, this is called anthrax. Now, I've got a picture of a cow here. Can you see? I've got a picture of the cow on the screen. And the cow actually, all right, it attacks, can attack the cow and it can attack us. So we can get it and cattle, goats, sheep, etc. they can all get anthrax. Okay, so it's not just, it's not like a virus that passes onto it. We can get it from cattle, yes, but it can, what this one is so dangerous with, it forms those spores and it lies in the ground for up to 20 years. Okay, so anthrax, what it does, have a look, it's not so lacquer. Okay, have you seen these? Oh, they form like these black sores on your body. And you will see it actually changes your, your brain, how it works. You've got fever, you're coughing, you're vomiting, you're nauseous, you're dizzy, headache. And you've got all these horrible, like black, it's called necrotic, it's dead skin. Right, that all these sores on your body. And the cows as well, they also have these sores, right? It's almost like bleeding inside. It's not really nice. And when we have this, yes, we can be treated with antibiotics. But because of those spores, management has to come, especially when it comes to cattle and human bodies, we have to do something a little bit, all right, more, um, how can I say, drastic. So how are we going to treat it? We can vaccinate our cattle. Right. We, don't, we don't generally get vaccinated for anthrax. So cattle, they're the ones who are mostly getting it. So we, we um, vaccinate the cattle against it so that the bacteria, if they do get it, our body, their body recognizes it and they could do something about it. But if a person dies from anthrax or cattle die from anthrax, the spores don't die. We need to actually burn it. All right. So the bodies need to be cremated if it's a human body or the cattle, etc. Unfortunately, we need to actually um, burn it so that we can burn those spores as well. Now, I don't know if you watch some movies, but you know what? They can make, you see I've got bioweapon over here. They can actually take anthrax and they use it for biological warfare. They can manufacture anthrax in the laboratory and I don't know if you've ever seen TV programs, it usually comes in an envelope as a white powder and people can inhale it. And it obviously, as you see, it makes them very, very sick, right? With the vomiting, the dizziness, their heads, right? You can die from it, okay? And all those sores all over their body, okay? So when it comes to anthrax, not very pretty, all right? Not a very pretty um, bacterial disease. But as I said to you, treat it. We can treat it with antibiotics. Okay, there we go. Okay, cholera. Now, cholera is a bacteria that we usually find, if you have a look at the picture over there, right? It's a vibrio, and what a vibrio means is a bacteria that looks like a comma, right? It's one of the shapes that I want to do show you that we had bacillus, we had the coccus, and this is like a comma one. Now, what happens here, this is, this is actually one of the funniest things, is because you have the same bacteria in your large intestine. Can you see that? Right. I've put a picture of your intestine in there, and what it does is this bacteria is really, really helpful. Now, what happens is if that same bacteria that's in your intestine we drink has a totally different effect. It really can, um, it makes the body quite sick. So usually now um, you'll see if, if you guys have had a lot of rain, maybe during flooding, when there's a lot of water and people are drinking the water, you see they might get sick or sometimes lots of areas don't have proper toilets, so they dig holes in the ground near water, and then they drink the water, and it's, you get sick because 
Remember the bacteria that's inside your intestines when you go to the toilet, when you have a feces, right, when you need a number two, are you allowed to say that? <laughs> and then what happens is the bacteria from the feces get into the water and it makes you very, very sick. Okay, so what is it? What is the, the effects on your body? Have a look here. Basically, you get a very serious um, diarrhea, right? So you get a diarrhea or you get vo vomit you're vomiting. So you're losing all the water in your body and you dehydrate. And dehydration can have a serious effect on your body, especially if you're a child. All right, children, if they have very serious runny tummies or they're vomiting, Okay, that can have a serious effect. So if you dehydrate, it can't be very good for you. Okay, and especially if you are elderly or very young and you're sick already. So you'll see here the more severe symptoms. It can actually affect your heart rate and your blood pressure. Okay, that's not really good when it starts to interfere with your heart. So not ideal. But the most important thing is, as I said to you, usually your body, the first response will be to try and get rid of it. And we flush our body with water. And that is the, the diarrhea and the vomiting. Not very nice at all. Okay, so guys, how do we stop it from occurring? It's bacteria. We've got to make ourselves, all right, very, very, very clean. So this, this is a concept that has come up constantly. When we did COVID, you were constantly washing your hands and sanitizing. And when we do that, we actually get rid of bacteria. Unfortunately, we also get rid of good bacteria, but we've got to make sure we clean. Now here, you've got to, if you've got, if, you, if you're constantly being sick or, or you do have a runny tummy, right, you have to make sure that you drink a lot of water. Now the water could make you sick in the first place. So please make sure that all water, if, you, if the water does look dirty, that you boil all the water before you drink it. So you boil it in a pot, in a kettle, and you leave it, and that's the water you drink. Because when we boil it, we're going to kill the bacteria. Okay. So everything, we can get vaccinated, we can have cholera vaccinations, right? but your food, also make sure that your food is cooked. Don't undercook food, because bacteria can also very often get into that food, and then it's going to make you sick as well. All right, guys, our last one is blight, or there's also rust, and this affects plants. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, what do plants have to do with it? Guys, you need to eat them. Farmers need to grow them. And our farmers need to be able to grow fruit that they can sell, that they can use. So if you have a bacterial disease, if you have a look over here, I don't know about you, but I really am not going to want to eat those grapes. And South Africa, what do we need grapes for? Yeah, we have a wine industry, okay? And here's tomatoes. I don't know about you, but I don't think that looks like a really nice tomato to eat. So if a bacterial disease is going to attack our foods, our farmers, it's going to affect it on our economy as well because the farmers can't sell it and we can't eat it, so it's going to be a waste. So what do they do? Okay, there we go. That's what it does. Okay, so quite simply, bacteria we can disinfect. So make sure if you do see that, maybe it's in your garden. Maybe you have a little patch that you're just growing vegetables for yourself and you see that. Think about things. Only when you cut things, make sure that all your instruments, your shears, your spade, etc., anything is nice and clean. Right? Have a look here. Also, don't do any kind of work when it's raining or wind, because that's going to, all right, make sure that it's going to spread. Also, interesting thing over there is if you are going to buy a plant, if you eat blight on the side of the street or from somewhere, check it first. Are the leaves nice and green? What does the fruit look like? You know, you need to actually look at your stock. And over here, the last one, don't water from overhead, right? Because if you water from the top, it stays on the top of the plant. So if I had to go back here, the water, if we water at the top, right, it stays moist 
all at the top and, the f and it actually rots. So it keeps it all nice and moist and the bacteria can grow nicely. So what we want to do, we want to have a water system that just waters the ground underneath. So the water is in the ground and it seeps into the ground and it doesn't stay onto the fruit. Okay, guys, that's all for now. We're going to have a small little break and we'll be right back. Welcome back, Life Sciences. I hope you just took a little bit of a stretch, a little bit of an exercise, got that blood pumping and the brain going, and we're ready to do more work on bacteria. Okay, so now we've looked at the structure, we've looked at the whole concept of what bacteria are. We just briefly went over a few diseases that you need to have one a good knowledge of, and now we're going to look at kind of questions you might find when, when you write your test or or your exam. Okay, let's start with the questions. Okay, the first one I always like to start off with a multiple choice question because the answers are there and it's nice to just get everything started. Okay, so what does the question ask us? And it's got quite a few big words in it, so we've got to try and make sure that we understand all right, what we're doing. The question is, what are the causative agents? And another word we could use there, what causes? And I could put there, and which microorganism? Okay, and method of transmission. It means how does it spread? That's what we're looking at. Okay, of tuberculosis. So they're asking you what microorganism, right, causes tuberculosis, and the second part is how does it spread? Right, so we've got various options here, and they need to manage, this must match, okay, column A and column B, so to speak, must ma match. Okay, so number A is bacterium, so is, right, is tuberculosis caused by bacterium? Yes, it is. And airborne droplets by sneezing or coughing, right, and the answer is yes. But we're just going to go and check, so I'm going to circle A because I think that is going to be the right answer, but I'm just going to check my other answers just in case, because B also is a bacterium, but it says it gets spread in water, and the one that we looked at was cholera, not TB, so that was incorrect, so it's not going to be B. Okay, C and D is a virus, and by now, right after today's lesson, Tuberculosis is not caused by a virus, so that automatically says definitely not C and D, so our answer definitely is going to be A. Okay, guys, the next diagram or the next couple of questions are going to be related to a diagram of the bacteria. As I said to you, one of the things you must be able to do is label the bacterium cell and know the functions of the different parts. So what does this, all right, what is this question asking us for? So here is the diagram, and it says the diagram shows a cholera bacterium. So it's telling us that it is cholera. It also is giving us a little bit of information, all right, there, over there, that you are going to need to maybe do some kind of calculation, that it's magnified 50,000 times, okay? So that whole little bit over here, there's lots of information in the title, and here is the diagram that we're going to have to use. How do I know it's a bacterium, right? It's a single cell. Yes, I can see it has a tail, and I, ca and I can see a round-like nucleus. All right, so what are the questions? It says A, F, and G, so I'm going to circle them, A, F, and G right, are all parts of the boundary layer. What is the boundary layer? So another word is the outer layers. And remember I said to you there are three outer layers that a bacterium cell will have. Now they've asked you to label them. Okay, so you can't just randomly label them. You need to know from the inside to the outside. Now A is pointing to the very inner one. 
So my A would be the cell membrane. That's the very first layer from the inside. B is point or G, sorry, is pointing to the second one. That would then be my cell wall. And my final is F, and that is the round, let's look a little bit squidgy, and that would be my capsule. Three marks, and I know this because I've learned my bacterium, I know how to label my diagrams. Okay, now the next question. How do you think this bacterium moves? Okay, so it's looking at the picture, what is going to give us an idea of how it moves? And it says here, in your answer, use evidence from the diagram. Okay, and it's telling you, you must use, is what in this diagram? So you're going to go here, and you're going to see that there is this structure over here. It's number E, and it is a flagellum. Now, let's see how we answer it. Let's answer it in as it goes. How do you think this bacteria moves? You can tell me it swims. That is your first mark. And then it says, in your answer, use evidence from the diagram. Why? The bacterium has, right, I'm just going to write here. The bacterium has a flagella or a flagellum right however way you've got there so use there we go your second mark you're using from the the di from the diagram over there okay this one now is going to be a calculation question now it says calculate the actual width of the cholera bacterium between points B and C Give your answer in micrometers and show your working. Okay, guys, so here we have the diagram of the bacterium, and we've been asked to find, all right, the actual size between B, or let me get my pen going again. There we go, lovely blue, between B and C. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm going to show you how to use the dam triangle, all right? And I'm not, as I said, I'm not swearing. What does the dam triangle mean? Okay, so when we look at the dam triangle, the D stands for drawing. So if you measure a drawing or a picture that you have drawn, A is the actual size. And this is the one that we have to look. So this is a question mark. And M stands for magnification. So in order to do this, I need to have two bits of information. Okay, so let's have a look. So if I was to do the formula, I put the A equals. Now I'm going to quickly change my pen color because I want to show you just something that I'm going to use. This line over here means divide. Okay, this line between A and M means times. So if I go back to my formula, I want to find A, because that's what it said, actual size. So I take D, which is my drawing, okay, and I divide it, because that's the divide line, over my magnification. Now I take my ruler, because I always take a ruler into the test, and I take my ruler and I measure this line over here from B to C, and I'm very accurate. And maybe it would be easier because we have to convert it to microns to do it in millimeters. So say, for example, I measure from B to C, and I see that it is 50 millimeters. So I write down, okay, because that's what I measured. The magnification was given to me, okay? So there we go, I put there 50,000 times. And now I'm going to work out. So over here, one, two, all right, there's one, so I only have to cross out one, not the two. So let's go back to that, take that out. And there's a reason why I don't teach maths. Okay, so one there, 
one there, all right, and then you take your calculator, you can use it anyway, or you can use it however you want, I don't even need to do it, just take your calculator and you take 50 divided by 50,000, don't try and do all of those funny little things, and you're going to get an answer, and because you measured in millimeters, you guys have got your calculator, you are going to give me your answer in millimeters. Okay, now you're not finished there. Now you need to convert it to microns. Now, that means you must take this answer, and you, so you answer that you got, and you times it by 1,000. And that will be your final answer, and the unit for microns or micrometers is that. Okay. Not so easy, I don't know if you've been taught the damn triangle, maybe you know a different way in which you have been taught, but this is the way that I teach my kids, right, and it's sometimes it's easier if they just remember the damn triangle. Okay, guys, one more question. Okay, now here is a bit of an experiment that we've set up, and this is what it says. Okay, so now there's an agar plate, okay, and that is how we grow bacteria. And on that plate with a culture of species of bacterium, usually found in the mouth. Okay, now we take four sterile. Sterile means that we've disinfected, they're pure, they've got nothing on them. And the paper discs A, B, C, and D, each containing a different brand of mouthwash. Now you use mouthwash because it's a disinfectant, it kills bacteria in your mouth, okay? And they were then placed on the agar plate. The drawing shows the appearance of the plate after it's been incubated, right, at 37 degrees for three days. So have a look at this diagram, okay? All of these little dots is where they put bacteria on, okay? Then they took these plates of, okay, little sterile plates, they were sterile. And what they did was they put the different mouthwashes on those little piece of paper all around here. Okay, now remember, mouthwash is antibacterial. So what they wanted to see was they were looking for the biggest area where no bacteria was grown. So obviously, the biggest area where there was white, that there was no bacteria, meant that the mouthwash works the best. Okay, so what question can we ask you over here? Right, first question. Explain why the paper discs, hang on a second, I think I, here we go, here we go. Which mouthwash is the most effective? Explain your reasoning. Okay, so which mouthwash had the most white area. So, you're going to put there number C, so you get your one mark, and then it says explain your reasoning why, and how did you explain it? You explained it, it had the largest area of no bacteria. Right, so that's what you're looking at. You grew this bacteria, and you now need to see, all right, why you did that. Okay, guys, one more question. I think then we're running out of time. Explain why the paper discs were sterile. So why did you have to put sterile paper discs there? Very important, all right? So no bacteria was growing on them. So they were pure. There was no growth wasn't going to interfere with your experiment at all. And if you notice, they grew it at 37 degrees, which was perfect temperature, body temperature. Okay, guys, that's all from us today. All right, hope you have a really good day, and we will see you next time.